Okay, great. You guys are on speakerphone. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us on such short notice today. I'm going to read a statement to you. Um, I have um, my co-counsel, code lead counsel in this case, on the phone, Mark Robinson of the Robinson Calcagney firm out of Newport Beach, and Kevin Boyle from the Panache Boyle firm out of Los Angeles. They have been the uh, heart and soul of the uh, leadership uh, committee for the plaintiffs for a year and a half now, and they have worked tirelessly on this case. And in my 32 years of practice, I can tell you that uh, these are the most outstanding lawyers I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Um, earlier this morning, uh, we as well as MGM released a news release that MGM Resorts and Council representing st substantially all plaintiffs in litigation involving the, one oct the October 1 shooting are announcing that we reached a settlement agreement to resolve pending lawsuits and claims against MGM Resorts regarding the events of October 1. The settlement agreement is comprehensive and includes all parties named in the lawsuits involving MGM. This is a complex situation and we wanted to take the time to provide you all with additional context and ensure that those joining us have the opportunity to ask questions today. Starting with the terms of the settlement, the total settlement amount is expected to be approximately 735 to 800 million dollars. Now as stated, and this needs to be made clear, MGM Resorts has insurance coverage for 751 million dollars uh, for this case. The range uh, depends on the number of claimants that choose to participate in the settlement and we expect quite frankly that all claimants, uh, represented claimants, will choose to participate. This agreement with the Plaintiffs' Council is a major step in it represents the resolution of the previously disclosed mediation efforts. This settlement is something that MGM and we hoped to accomplish for quite some time. MGM believes and has believed from the beginning and we agree that prolonged litigation around these matters is in no one's best interest and it is our sincere hope that this agreement means that this scenario will be avoided. MGM's stated goal from the outset of this litigation was to resolve these matters so that the community, the victims, and their families can move forward in the healing process. And today's announcement is a step forward in this direction and proof, in my mind, that MGM meant what they said at the outset of this litigation that their desire was to resolve this thing globally. We at MGM truly believe that this settlement will provide fair compensation for thousands of victims and their families. This has been a long process, but we at MGM believe that this conclusion is best for the, our community, the company, and the victims. Under the settlement agreement, all parties will dismiss and release all pending litigation against MGM Resorts. With regard to next steps, an independent claims administrator or administrators will be appointed by the court shortly to create procedures for allocating a settlement fund among the participating claimants, which MGM Resorts will fund with a minimum of $735 million through its insurance companies. I would like to make clear that this settlement is not an admission of liability by MGM, by any stretch of the imagination. There were strong arguments on both sides of this case, and, def and MGM had very good defenses in this case. It was a difficult case, there's no doubt about it. And while nothing will be, bring, uh, be able to bring back the lives lost or undo the horrors so many suffered on that day, this settlement will provide fair compensation for thousands of victims and their family. Having the privilege of representing 24 or 2,500 approximately of the 4,400 victims, um, this uh, situation has had profound effects on me personally. The stories that all of you I'm sure have heard about uh, 
what happened that night and the impacts on these people uh, has, uh, is horrific. But this is a step in the right direction to try to put that behind us uh, for our community and these victims. We do share the belief that the term with MGN that the terms of this settlement represent the best outcome for our clients and will provide the greatest good for those impacted by these events. I would like to say a few words about MGM. I have been practicing law now for 32 years. And I was thinking last night that I know I have sued at least hundreds and probably over a thousand companies and corporations during my career for various different negligence or product liability cases. In that time frame, this is the first time that I've ever had the ability and the desire to say something good about the defendant in this case. I want to tell you that in my view, what MGM has done here through this process and through this mediation represents the highest standard of corporate citizenship I have ever seen in my career. They are, quite frankly, a shining example of what corporations can do in America in that they can both do well for their shareholders as well as do well for the community. And MGM has proved that in this case. In my view, they have set the bar for corporate citizenship around the country. And as a lifelong Nevadan, I cannot tell you how proud I am that MGM is a Nevada company here in, Las, in Nevada. We all know that they are the largest employer in our state. But what they have proved here, and they've proved many times before, is that they are an important member of our community, and they genuinely care about Las Vegas and Nevada as a whole. And what they have done here through this settlement is quite, uh, quite frankly, uh, astonishing in my view. You just don't see normally this type of corporate behavior uh, in America very often. Um, as I said, I have my uh, co-lead counsel on the phone, Mark Robinson, who is going to be joining us today, is tied up in court. Um, his partner and son, Dan Robinson, is on the phone, along with uh, Kevin Boyle uh, from the Panache Boyle firm. And I'd like to turn it over for them, to them for a few uh, remarks. I will come back and make some closing statements, and then we will open it up for questions uh, for all of you. Dan, you want to go ahead? Uh, sure. Uh, first, uh, thanks for the kind words, Robert. Uh, this has obviously been a case that uh, played a, a very, very uh, important role for um, everything that we are trying to accomplish for these victims who we've gotten to know, uh, many on a first name basis. Uh, these folks have their lives had their lives tragically upended uh, by the October shooting. And we hope and pray that this uh, settlement is a step in the right direction of enabling them to get some compensation that will achieve some sense of peace and closure going forward. Uh, it's been an honor and privilege to represent these clients, our firm. I represent about a third of the clients in the one October settlement agreement. Um, and uh, it is a uh, 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 product of a very long, hard fought litigation and negotiation uh, upon which we reach this, uh, what we believe is a tremendous settlement. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dan. Kevin? Uh, yes, uh, Robert. Uh, then, uh, then also thanks for the kind words. This is Kevin Boyle of the Panaching Law Office in Los Angeles. <clears throat> I want to reiterate that it has been an honor uh, to represent these victims who went through this horrific tragedy. Um, I believe that this is the first time in history that a company has stepped up 
and aid the victims of a mass shooting. Uh, as we all know, there is a mass shooting epidemic in this country, and we believe that this settlement not only will help compensate the victims of the Route 91 festival, we think it can drive real change in making some common sense laws uh, in this country that can prevent future mass shooting. And that is the greatest uh, achievement, hopefully, because once corporate America realizes that it needs to step up and accept financial responsibility, uh, those power companies can put pressure on the government uh, to make some real change in this country. So it's been an honor, and thank you all very much, everyone. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, before I open the statement, uh, open it up for questions, I just want to make a few more comments. And I, I would be remiss um, if, if I didn't speak about MGM's employees in the broader Las Vegas community here. As MGM's CEO, Jim Murin, has said on multiple occasion, occasions, MGM has the best employees in the business, surrounded by one of the best communities in the world, Las Vegas. While the past two years have been challenging, MB MGM's employees' support of each other and the broader community has been inspiring. The trust, loyalty, and dedication that MGM's valued employees have shown to their great company has allowed them to unite and do what is right as they move forward. And we and the MGM hope this agreement will allow the victims, first responders, and the entire community to look forward to the future and continue on a path forward toward healing. Um, I do want to point out that um, we did work tirelessly since early Feb February of this year. This mediation went on for just short of eight months. Um, uh, Jim Murin and John McManus, their general counsel and the MGM's team and their lawyers were exceptional. They were professional throughout this entire process, and I cannot say a good, enough good things about them. I really can't, and, and that is an unusual position for me to be in, but I cherish it today because it's all true. Um, the, um, while the, um, um, uh, so again, I want to commend MGM, and I want to say to you that I'm not just saying this because this case settled. And, and, they're, and they've agreed to sell this game. I, I'm saying this because of the way they were throughout this mediation. It became very clear to me within just a few weeks of starting this mediation that MGM desire was to help our community and help these victims. And I'm very proud of what they've done here today. This time, we'll open it up to questions. Mr. Abel, I'm kind of shocked by your turnaround on MGM. This is a company that uh, sued the victims, uh, tried to avoid liability by having it uh, declared a terrorist attack. Uh, what happened between, uh, how do you account for their behavior up until you began the Well, first of all, every defendant has a right to, to defend themselves. Uh, the Safety Act has never been tested under these circumstances. MGM had the right, um, certainly, to do that, to see if it would apply. Um, so uh, I, I stand by the fact that, you know, every defendant has. However, you are right. Uh, look, last year, I was the loudest voice in the country, and probably Mark Robinson was the second loudest voice in the country, saying negative things about MGM when they sued uh, a number of the victims. Uh, in this case. And MGM at that time, you'll recall, kept saying to the press, we just want to figure out a way to get all these cases in one venue so we can work toward resolution of the litigation. And I, I, didn't, I didn't believe them. I said, I don't believe that's true. And you know, I said that in the in press conference. But I was wrong. I was wrong. And they proved that to me in the first several weeks of this mediation. It became very clear that that was their intention. Now, we didn't agree on the procedural methods they were going about, and that's why the mediation was so successful, because we were able to agree on the right, I think, the best procedure to get this case resolved. But after going through eight months of this mediation with with MGM, I do not doubt their good intentions at this time. You also said that uh, 
they were aware of the risks. You alleged in your pleadings that they were aware of the risks and that they uh, obviously insured against it. Uh, do, do you have any feeling or any reason to believe that they have mitigated against those risks now? I do. Why? Well, I'm not, I'll let the MGM talk to you about that. I wish they would. Well, and I think they will eventually, but, uh, I, you know, I, I think, yes, and I will tell you, they, they, I, they have made me the most loyal customer they'll ever have. If I have family and friends, uh, family or friends in town, I'm putting them up at an MGM property every time now because they have, to me, shown the most outstanding corporate citizenship I have ever witnessed, and I think all of us in this case have ever witnessed in our careers. Yes. Mr. Eichel, there have been a number of lawsuits regarding this. Does this settle everything? Um, just give me a sense of the legal universe we're looking at here. Is this it now? Yes. And so that's the short answer. Um, there was a number of lawsuits, you will call, uh, filed very early, shortly after the incident. Um, and there was lawsuits filed here as, as well as in Los Angeles. Uh, my leadership team and I were on the phone. We organized um, all the plaintiffs' lawyers, which I think is about 65 plus firms that are under our umbrella uh, working with us in this case. Starting in January of 2018, we met, started meeting here as well as in, is, is in Los Angeles once a month with everyone. We got, we coordinated our efforts. We dismissed all of those cases. Now there was, there's some still, I think, three pending cases in federal court in California that were filed that um, they were in a procedural posture where they couldn't be dismissed uh, at, the, at that point. But the only lawsuit actually filed here in Nevada that's still that existing was the Shepard case, which after we coordinated our efforts, we filed that amended complaint in May or June of 2018. Then the litigation started motion practice for several months, and, and then, then it was not long after that, about a year ago, that MGM approached us um, and suggested that we try to enter into a mediation process, which we did. It took some time to set up. I, I would also like to say that, uh, speaking of the mediation process, the two mediators that mediated this case between the parties, it's retired Judge Jennifer Tagliati, here in Las Vegas, and retired Judge uh, Lou Messinger out of California. They did an absolutely exceptional job. This was, this was an incredibly complex situation involving roughly 4,400 victims, all with varying types of injuries or deaths. Um, and we were trying to resolve this case, you know, before the two-year statute of limitations uh, ran and by their guidance and their hands, they were able to manage the parties through this process, and, and I commend them as well. Can you talk about the communication process with those victims, uh, with those victims, and in the run up to this settlement? The um, victims um, knew our clients knew that we were in negotiations. We knew they knew that we were very close to a settlement. The settlement was not actually final until this Monday, this past Monday, just a few days ago. And in consultation with the MGM, we all determined or decided that it would not be appropriate for us to announce this before the two-year anniversary with all the, the events that were scheduled to um, honor that that to your anniversary and the victims and decided to wait at least a couple of days after that so because we knew MGM certainly knew and we knew well how important that was for our community um, but the process is is you know has, has, has gone um, as smoothly as it can and uh, you know, we're very as I said we're pleased with the outcome I think you said just a moment ago but I want to be clear Exactly how many plaintiffs does this cover? Is that the entirety of the class, or are there still cases outside of the class? There is no class. This is not a class action lawsuit. Resolve it, would, it, it resolves all the claimants that are represented by the leadership group and our umbrella group. 
which is roughly 4,400, which we believe is all of the claimants. Now, I don't know if there's other claimants out there, but the statute of limitations has now run on them. You know, we, as you know, it was reported, we agreed with uh, MGM to, um, uh, to it, as part of the settlement, several months into the mediation, they agreed and we agreed to toll the statute of limitations because we were making such good progress. We didn't want to be concerned about the statute of limitations. So the statute of limitations for the represented clients was extended till the middle of next year. And what was the average dollar payout to Well, there's no such thing as an average dollar payout, and I don't know, because the, uh, uh, the third-party administrators, which will be appointed by the court, have to go through and allocate the money between the, the claimants, and that has to be done by an independent third party, and that's what will take place. So will it be a tiered system based on injuries or emotional suffering? Well, again, you know, that is, that is the responsibility of the third party uh, administrators to determine that. I'm sure they're going to have some sort of system with respect to base, whether it's a death case or an injury case, and the nature of the injuries, all that will be taken into, into consideration. But that's their responsibility to do that, and that has to be independent to make this um, kosher. What happens to the um, patterns, the shooters? Uh, is, this, is his money or the, his estate involved in this at all? You know, you know that, that money was earmarked for uh, whatever is left, and I don't know what's left, but that, that money was earmarked by the uh, state lawyers and the family to go just to the death victims. I don't know how that be allocated. That's a separate issue. And how many firms exactly firms other companies? It's somewhere north of 65, I'm not sure. And are you willing to disclose what percentage of firms are getting for the representation? What percentage of uh, that, you know, that I don't know what every firm's fee agreements are, so I, I can't speak to that. And that's What's yours? What? What's yours? It varies between different clients. So a lot, many of our cases are, are referrals from other lawyers, so we're whatever, I don't, I'm not even sure what their fee agreements are. Well, a lot are. of the bulk of these victims are PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome. That's true. Survivors, that's where it seems to be the bulk of these of victims in this situation. That's probably true, yes. Mr. Edward, I want to underscore a question just came about the money for firms. You didn't want to say. Um, can you say I don't know, if, honestly. If this goes up to $800 million, which is the cap, how much of that would go to... Well, the overwhelming majority of it, I don't know what every lawyer's fee agreement is. I'm not privy to that information, so I can't, I can't disclose that. Any estimation of when the victims can expect to see Well, that's, the that's a good question. This process with this many victims is obviously going to take some time. Um, the court will have to appoint the third-party administrators. There's a process we have into place where pe the, the time when people have to opt into the settlement, uh, and then the third-party administrators will have to value all the claims. We are expecting that will probably not be until the end of next year until the, the, uh, it is funded and the money is dispersed to the, to the uh, injured victims. Have all the victims been notified? Yes. Do you know how many victims are here in Nevada, California? I don't think, I don't know if we have ever done that breakdown, have we, Robert? Dan, uh, Dan, Dan, do you know the answer to that question? It's uh, over 50% are uh, basically from California uh, traveled into Las Vegas for the concert. The large, large portion is also uh, in Nevada, Las Vegas, right? Dan Kenwood from the Associated Press, do you know how many other states are represented along with Canada? Yeah, there are at least eight other states uh, with individuals who attend the concert. We know that from the declaratory judgment actions filed by MGM against the victims. Uh, and uh, there are also probably a few other states represented by, by victims. Mr. Eckler or, or yes. Mr. Robinson, can you say what court we can see these administrators, and you said administrators, not a single. Well, it's, 
that hasn't the decision hasn't been made. It'll be made in the next couple of weeks, whether it's a multiple or just one. The court uh, currently, just to give you a procedural history, when the Shepard case was filed in state court here in front of Judge Crockett, I believe, um, uh, that case was removed to federal court by MGM, where we, we engaged in motion practice and motions to remand, and there were uh, other motions filed, if not really important. Right before we expected those motions to be ruled upon, we entered into a stay in the case to stay everything. Now, part of the procedure here is that the, uh, the parties have agreed that the Shepard case will be remanded back to state court, and so the vehicle for accomplishing the settlement will be through a district court here in Nevada. Still Judge Crockett? I don't know if Judge Crockett uh, will will continue to handle it or the chief judge will take over that. That's the court the court's business. I, I don't know. Can you, cl can you clarify how many people are named in the lawsuit and for those who are not named, can they still benefit from the payout? Um, only the people on the the tolling agreement that we agreed to with MGM, which changed over time from when we first entered it. More people have been added as we've added more claimants, but I think it's about 4,400. And then just 2,500 just for your law firm? Well, my, my law firm as well as the, the, the firms that were with us that referred their cases to us, associated us in on the cases to work with them. Um, and, as Dan said, uh, their firm has about a third of the victims, and a lot of those cases were these law firms that associated w in with us. Most, not all, but most of the law firms in this, the group of 65 associated with one of the leadership groups, either the Panache Boyle firm, the Robinson Calcagish firm, or my firm. So there are other lawsuits we can understand from the of your colleagues in the other on the line. There are other lawsuits out there. There, there are, there are the three. Well, these lawsuits we have, we have these lawsuits. Uh, um, Dan, you want to speak to this about the the the, the two uh, the three cases in federal court in in um, in California, and then of course the, I'm sorry, what? And then one was recently filed, I guess, before the statute. But with respect to the deck actions and the the three cases pending in. Uh, um, California, those cases will be dismissed and will be put into this settlement. And Dan, you want to speak about the case that was just filed? Uh, sure. This is Dan Robinson from Robinson County. Uh, first, I want to echo what Robert said. Uh, I've found this being the largest group of just our three leadership firms. Uh, there are about 40 firms, many great lawyers. Uh, James Lee, Craig Island, I could give a laundry list mile long uh, of incredible lawyers that have helped us uh, achieve this great result for their clients. The three cases that are currently pending in uh, federal court are cases that are, uh, the clients are represented by my firm and Mr. Boyle's firm. Uh, there are uh, some additional three new filings um, that uh, were filed for the October 1st uh, two-year anniversary, and uh, we're looking into whether there are additional cases that have been filed, but those are the only ones uh, that we're aware of at this time. Yeah, so the only cases outside of our group that are aware of that are filed is these three cases that were just filed. How many clients do these cases cover? Three. Are there other defendants, uh, Contra Promoter, for example? Pardon me? Are there other defendants, like the Contra Promoter? Uh, what do you mean? Other you oh, mean in these cases are, that are filed? Defendants that are still being sued are still being litigated against. Uh, I don't actually. I haven't seen the complaint because it just got filed the other day on this. And maybe Dan can speak to that. I don't know if they sued. Security company. I don't know who they sued. Yeah, they, this is Dan again. They sued uh, Live Nation, CFT, and some other parties. I think one of the cases even sued the, the shooter, Mr. Paddock. Um, we are reaching out to those firms so that they have the benefit of some of the, uh, the, the knowledge that we gained over the last two years, um, and uh, we hope to be figuring out a way to coordinate uh, with them uh, in short time. Uh, Jeff, 
killing of them used to be used in Las Vegas. So what you're saying, sir, is there are still live cases against Live Nation, Slide Fire, and the Patica State, correct? Well, okay, the, the case against Live Nation, it, it, the only one he's talking about is the three new that were just filed. Gotcha. The case against Slide Fire, that's a different case. That's a case, that's a class action we filed right. three days after the incident. And we have been in federal court on motions on that case for two years, and we just got an order back saying we can proceed against Slide Fire in federal court in that case. Just, just to clarify, the 751 million I don't know the parameters of that. I don't know what, um, you know, I don't know what, if anything, Live Nation or CSC is uh, uh, putting in. But I just don't know the answer to that. So uh, I just know what the total amount is. Can you help us clarify? You mentioned uh, statute of limitations several times. Uh, is there a window still open for people to file, or is that closed? It, unless they are part of the group that are represented by our collective group and subject to the tolling agreement, if they have not filed a lawsuit, in my opinion, their case is barred by the statute of limitations. Is there anything besides monetary that you guys asked for? Well, you know, um, I don't want to get into the details uh, of the, the mediation because a lot of that's confidential between us and MGM. Um, I can just say that we, we talked about a, a wide parameter of issues, and in particular how we could procedurally get this done, and, um, and, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Again, I, I just want to say that um, I'm very impressed with MGM here. I really am. Well, they can they can contact either the the Panache Boyle firm or the uh, Robinson Cal Cagney firm or our firm, and we would be able to answer those questions for them. But they have to have filed already. Well, unless there's some other circumstances, you know, unless they're a minor or something like that, that that, that yeah, I think that they they would have had to somehow protect the statute. But but we of course are willing to talk to them. So. Did you outline in the terms of the agreement how claims would be determined and how money would be divided? No, and we can't do that because of all the the number of claimants. That's why an independent, these independent third-party administrators are um, retained. And this is this is the common way to do this in all mass tort cases: is you have a third-party administrator or administrators who go in. There's a lump sum settlement. Then they go in and allocate the money between the various weapons, and that's always how it's done. Um, and, and it's it's the proper way to do it. It's the only way to do it. Did you talk John. to MGM about the means that would be proposed to the judge in uh, what do we say? Perhaps it'll be here in Clark County. Did you talk about the names that would be proposed for that? We have talked about that, but again, right now that's confidential. I, I don't want to share that. Can John? I understand there are an awful lot of victims, and so there's going to be a lot of a lot of moves and emotions there. Uh, can you generally describe how anxious uh, the victims were to go forward and to fight, or were they uh, more of a mind to resolve to mediate? You know, obviously, I haven't. I haven't spoken to all 4,400 victims, John. I, I can tell you that our experience is that no one uh, wanted to go through protracted litigation. If this case could be resolved without that, if, if the parties would have continued to, you know, fight this out, this case likely would have gone on for over a decade. And that would not have been good for the victims. It would not have been good for this community. It would not have been good for MGM. So this is the best solution for everybody. Uh, we talked about this being a landmark settlement. You kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. You know, what are some of the big impacts that this settlement can have on how cases like this are litigated in the future? Well, I mean, you know, this is this was an unusual case. Um, by any stretch of the imagination, um, uh, I hope 
as as Mr. Boyle pointed out, I hope this has some impact. I hope this in, inspires our leaders in Washington to do something about this. I mean, every single day now, literally every single day in America, there is a mass shooting of some kind. And if you talk to anyone, anyone who, from another country who wants to migrate to the United States, they will tell you, their, re, their number, 9 out of 10 of them, or 99 out of 100 will tell you, I want to go to America because that's the land of the free. We have freedom there in America. And that's what is, why they want to come here. You know, but in the words of Roosevelt, freedom is freedom from, in America, is freedom from fear and, uh, and freedom from tyranny. Are we really free? Are we really free when children in our country are afraid to go to school because they might get shot? Are we really free in this country where people are afraid to go to the movies or even the grocery store for fear that there may be some mass shooting out there? Are we really free in this country when people in Las Vegas and, the, and our visitors can't enjoy a concert on a beautiful fall night here in Las Vegas? Are we really free? I don't feel very free with those type of things. So I hope, I mean, I hope, and I would echo what Kevin said, I would hope our leaders in Washington will take notice of this and do something about it. I'm not optimistic that's going to happen, but I still have hope. What's the solution? You know, I don't, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, I, I'm not confident that um, we can get any sort of meaningful uh, gun safety legislation passed in Washington with the partisanship and the, the influence the NRA seems to have still on, on many of these politicians. And, and uh, uh, I'm not, you know, if, if any legislation passed, I, I, I fear it would be a, a, you know, a bill with a fancy name like, you know, gun violence prohibition bill that doesn't do anything to, to prevent gun violence. Um, if you want to know my personal view on this, you want to, you want to put a stop to this? Congress should repeal, repeal that gun legislation bill they passed a couple of decades ago where they gave give immunity to gun manufacturers and ammunition manufacturers from lawsuits. I mean, automobile manufacturers don't have immunity. If they put a defective product out on the, on, the, on the streets, they're responsible for it. People who make toasters, if it, it's defective and it burns down your house, they have to answer for that. Why do the gun manufacturers get a free ride? And so if you want to do something about the gun violence in this country, repeal that statute and let American juries decide if the risk of putting these type of weapons of mass murder on the streets outweighs the benefit. I have a feeling the American juries would stop the sale and cause a lot of incentive to the gun manufacturers to stop making and selling these types of weapons in this country if they were subject to liability just like every single other industry in our country is for their negligence or their defective products. So that's my personal viewpoint. That's the quickest way and swiftest way to try to at least put a dent in this problem. Hey, Robert. Of course, Kevin, go ahead. Okay, I completely agree with what um, Robert just said. Number one, repeal that law. And not only will juries start going out, uh, gun manufacturers might change their ways. The NRA might have to change its ways. Uh, and, and then, you know, in the end, just put it an $800 million bill uh, for uh, AK, AK-47 manufacturers 
right? And this guy's had it, was able to buy, I think it was 23 AK-47s in one year. I mean, should the federal government allow someone to be able to buy 23 AK-47s in a year? Shouldn't a red flag have gone up? I mean, it's lunacy. And you know, now companies like MCM are, are stepping into this. I think the government's going to listen to companies like that. And maybe they can say, hey, maybe you should put a law in effect that someone can either not buy an AK-47 or can only buy one a year. Who needs more than one? Uh, it's crazy. So I agree with you, Bob. I think those weapons should be off the street, period. No American citizen needs a, a weapon that's designed for one purpose, to kill as many human beings as fast as you can. That's what they're designed for. Counselor, if this case wasn't brought, this particular case that we're talking about today wasn't brought against gun manufacturers, it was brought against MGM Resorts, owner of Mandalay Bay. It was a liability. Only because the only because the gun manufacturers have federal immunity. And this was a liability claim. What, can you tell us what makes you so comfortable now? What has changed from before to now that you would have your friends and family say that? Again, I, I don't want to get into the details of, of our discussions with MGM, and I will let them speak to those issues. Um, because uh, I don't want to step on their toes. Um, but I can tell you that I'm fully satisfied that their hotels are safe. This is, this is Mr. Robinson. Uh, I, I just wanted to echo um, the comments about MGM stepping up here. We really do think, even though it was a hard fought litigation and they have very good counsel. That uh, this is a, a, a very, very substantial step in the right direction, not just for MGM, but for all uh, and the, the path of responsibility for uh, an event like this. So, with that, I, I really just want to focus the rest of today on, on these victims. Um, how their lives have been turned upside down for the last two years. And uh, we reached out to every one of them in the last couple days or the last several months. And the overwhelming response, without breaching any privilege, has been positive. And we're very happy for them. And uh, we're very proud to serve them as their lawyers. Well said, Dan. MGM has said that the settlement is not an admission of liability. What That's true. It's, I said that too. It's not. What, um, what do you think the um, claimants will say to that? Well, look, every litigation and virtually every settlement that occurs in, uh, in American litigation like this, um, there's an agreement that is not an admission of liability. And so we agree to that. This, is not, this was, as Dan said, this was a hard-fought case. This would have been a difficult case on both sides. There was a tremendous amount of risk on both sides. And, uh, you know, MGM, in our view, as I said, stepped up and did the right thing. But that, it, you are right. There is no admission of liability uh, by MGM, and there's nothing wrong with that in, in these situations. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.